Welcome back everyone to theCUBE here in our Palo Alto studio in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, head of our research at SiliconANGLE Research and also co-host of theCUBE, featuring the AI leaders and in infrastructure here at theCUBE, part of the NYSE Wired event series, theCUBE obviously here. Sid Sheet, who's the founder and CEO of D-Matrix is here with us, entrepreneur, uh, two-time entrepreneur, three-time, how many times have you started a company? This is my third time uh, incubating a business. Yeah. <laughs> great, great, great. <laughs> love to have you. This is about leaders who are really on the front edge of, of this next generation. Yeah. And we're seeing as part of this new kind of social network gathering of AI infrastructure, because all the problems that need to be solved now are make it go faster, smaller, faster, cheaper. Reminds me of the big PC revolution yeah. as things, as productivity increased. Gen AI is demanding performance. Yep. And it's not the same architecture and gear or hardware. Um, the game is still the same, faster, yeah. but it's different. This is the topic. You guys are in the middle of it. Talk about D-Matrix, what do you guys do? Yeah, so D-Matrix, we are an AI compute company. And uh, you know, AI compute, when you talk about AI compute, there is two aspects to it, there's training, there is inference. Uh, D-Matrix is focused on the inference part of AI compute, uh, which is the part where you actually deploy all the AI models and you monetize AI and uh, you know, uh, that's, that's the part where AI actually becomes useful, right? Uh, so we build the chips, we build the software, uh, the whole, whole uh, you know, the hardware and the software to go along uh, with the solution, the cards, the accelerator cards. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, our goal is to really make inference affordable and uh, commercially viable, specifically generative AI inference commercially viable for everyone. And if you look at uh, what's been going on in the industry, Dave and I have been uh, documenting this with the cloud growth. We saw it with Amazon with Annapurna acquisition. Yep. I think Dave, you call it the best acquisition I think Amazon's done. Oh, yeah. Getting to the silicon level, Apple's been doing it, yep. it's well known. So having that silicon power has been key, but now that the enterprise is starting to see this and all businesses yeah. are seeing supercomputing capabilities come yeah. in to the, into visibility, they're rethinking how they design their hardware, infrastructure, data center, edge, basically their distributed computing powering systems. This is yeah. where the action is. So memory, compute, yep. Yep. how it's, the form factors are all being re-architected. Can you share your thoughts on what's happening? Because the folks out there are looking at completely rebuilding the foundation of the enterprise right now. Right, right, and not just the enterprises. This is, you know, you're rebuilding everything, right? Data center infrastructure, edge infrastructure, compute infrastructure, which powered everything that we did for the last 30, 40 years is being redone, right? And it's being rebuilt and it is being done with an emphasis around AI. And the AI workloads are fundamentally different from the workloads that came before, which are more scalar. These are more parallel, more vector-oriented workloads. So the compute infrastructure has to change. And it just you know, so happens that this is a very taxing workload. The AI workload is very taxing. So you need to essentially re-architect not just the compute, you're re-architecting compute, interconnects, you know, the way you store data, the way you retrieve data, the way you scale out, how you, you know, pull power into these data centers because you need a lot more compute. So there's a lot more power to and energy needed. Uh, how do you build racks? Uh, and how do you build a cluster of uh, data centers in a region? How do you connect them to everything is being redone, right? Um, Guys, bring up the power law, if you would. I want to I want to ask Sid a question on this. So the, whole, the two dimensions are of size of model and model specificity, mm -hmm. uh, and within industry in, in particular, where on this curve do you play? So we we play across the spectrum, right? Uh, we we are obviously starting on uh, the left hand side, which you know, mainly because that is where all uh, AI models, most of the AI models today reside, in some kind of a data center today. And I think we kind of envision that they will stay there for the yeah. foreseeable future till uh, applications emerge that can be truly monetized and can be, you know, I would, I would expect that applications from that point on start migrating towards the edge, closer to the edge, right? Uh, so we are starting on the left. Uh, we have built a compute platform that is built with chiplets, so it's got a lot of elasticity built into the platform. So we can scale the platform up or down depending on the size of models. So in this particular case, we would start on the left with a platform that has a lot more chiplets, a lot more compute that can serve the big models. And then over time, as the workloads migrate to the right, we would be able to kind of scale down our platforms and kind of migrate with the workloads to the right. So thanks guys, appreciate that. So what are the unique requirements as you go down to the right side of that curve? Different obviously the left side, the chiplet architecture gives you the flexibility right. to, to mix and match and customize for the specific workload. What are the unique requirements of that AI inferencing at, at the edge? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's efficiency cost. Uh, because as you get closer to the edge, uh, you know, it is all about 
doing something that is very specific really, really well, but doing it extremely cost effectively, right? And uh, so the emphasis changes. Uh, the emphasis is not so much cost when you're on the right-hand side. There it is mostly about can you really serve big models? Can you be yeah. general enough? Uh, can you still do it cost yeah. effectively? Of course, that is always important when you're doing inference, but it's not the most pressing problem. Things like power, things like uh, latency, these type of metrics are more important on, on the left-hand side, but cost becomes a lot more important as you go. We well, got energy and memory are also factored right. into that too. Memory right. hungry applications. Right, and, right. And you use uh, RISC-V for, for, for certain portion of the architecture and you've developed your own architecture. Can you explain that? Yes, yes. So we have, uh, you know, what we quickly realized was, uh, again, you know, to your power law chart there, if you are on the, on the left-hand side, you're trying to be as generic as possible, right? And for that, you know, there's not one compute engine that can serve all, all the, you know, all the different kind of workloads. So what we did was we built four different types of compute engines in our, in our chip, right? Uh, we have a RISC-V engine that is mostly used, and we have not built it, we license it. Uh, that is mainly used to move data in and out of the chip, right? So there is, there is that piece. But there are three other compute engines. There is an in-memory computing engine, which is focused on matrix math inference, right? Uh, matrix math is about 50 to 70% of any AI workload. Uh, the in-memory computing engine is used for that. There are two other computing engines which are transpose engines. These are very transformer specific. So as you know, generative AI is primarily powered by transformer type workloads. So we have specific engines that can accelerate transformers on the chip. Uh, so we have you know, kind of a collection of engines. So matrix math is relatively simple, but there's a lot of it. And so, yeah. so can you do that type of matrix math you know, without a, a, a GPU? I, we, we hear both sides of, of that argument. Help us understand the, the truth. Uh, matrix, matrix math can be done on GPUs. It's just now that it won't be that efficient, mm -hmm. right? And when you're looking at inference, uh, it's all about efficiency. It is about uh, you know, how can you do this with the least amount of power, most cost effectively, uh, what's the maximum latency I can, you know, the lowest latency I can get, sorry, uh, so that users have a wonderful experience when they are using these applications, right? So that's where having an in-memory compute engine, uh, which is very good with matrix math, where data and, and uh, you know, you're essentially keeping the model weights very close to where the compute happens. So you're not moving stuff around. You save a lot of energy, you save a lot of time, and that is the crux of, of solving the inference problem. Said so you guys are building a new computing platform, mm -hmm. which is essentially and the multiple engines. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can bring up that power law again, I want to get your thoughts on how the market responds to this because we put this out what a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. People were like, "What? You know, what is this?" Now it's becoming pretty much standard. But look at the look at the tail, right? It's a classic power law, but it's got no neck and no torso. So the red area is an area we see where, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the work you're doing. Mm -hmm hits the gap here because specialty models seem to be in the long tail, yep. they're on premise. As we heard from most of the ec other experts in our network is that people are building their own models and training them on premise because proprietary data is right. valuable. Right. They might interface with the large frontier models for other things right. through the through APIs or whatnot. If that torso grows, mm -hmm. you got a fat belly. Absolutely. That's where I think the action will be. So the question right. is, in your mind, is that where you're seeing the uh, enablement from the advances in the hardware and infrastructure and the chips. I mean, look at Lamba, I mean, they're already feeding the developers, they're coding away, but mm -hmm. does that shift in your mind and what, is, what does that mean? Well, I mean, it will shift. It will shift and that is, that is what, uh, you know, models like Lama are trying to accomplish and to accelerate that shift, right? Because right now, uh, access to AI models, and especially the frontier ones, is only you know, available to a handful of companies. It's you know, some of the very large companies that have access to that. They are APIs, so you really don't, you, know, you can only access it through an API. Um, but you know, how do we democratize this, right? How do we make uh, models of that capability available to other developers who can then write stuff on top of it and unlock new applications? Yeah. And, and that, it, is, that is what we would love, because as soon yeah. as that happens, people need a lot more inference. And, yeah. and I think that's where your bet comes home. So that's why I want to bring that up, is because we've been saying and we've been Pointing out, I love you. He explain your words that you're seeing training and, and inference for the yep. layman maybe watching, yep. because inference is an always-on thing. You're Correct. always inferring. Yep. Training you can, can not do once, but you can fine-tune it. But yep. you get it out of the way, yep. and then you move on to like right. training, right. reinforced learning, right. and inference. So right. to explain the difference between why training and inference. Why there's so much emphasis on inference versus yep. training. So you know, if I may, if I may, I'd like to kind of share an analogy, right? Yep. I mean, that might help uh, your right. listeners. Uh, is you know it's not very different from us human beings, right? Uh, we are born, we go to school for the first 20 years of our life, we educate ourselves, and that's training, right? I mean, uh, it's costly going to college uh, these days and uh, you know, going through school and whatnot. But the first 20 years of your life is, is essentially training, 
and then once you're educated, you're applying all that knowledge for the remaining 40 years of your life, and that is where you actually earn uh, your your income, and you you know you 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 know you live you live your life, and it's done, and you're learning as you go through that, you're learning new stuff, and you're applying it, right? And that is the inference. So inference is always the part where you take what you have been trained on, and apply it. And that is always going to be the bigger piece, yeah, right? There's a little reinforcement, there's some fine tuning, maybe yes. some little training, exactly. new stuff. So it's not very different, yeah, yeah. So you're in execution mode, and that's right. where the compute, all the memory, all the stuff you guys are doing yeah. hits home, right? And that's yeah. and that's going to be in the enterprise. What, where was that? Where does that show up? Servers, clustered systems. Where does that infrastructure look like? Yeah. So today it is in uh, what we call AI servers, right? So the the big upgrade that is happening is with uh, with servers. The the traditional servers were CPU oriented servers. Now you're getting accelerator oriented servers, right? Uh, so the CPU is kind of taking a backseat. Uh, the servers are heavily dominated by accelerated compute. Uh, that is the first upgrade that is happening today, and we are part of that. We are building you know cards that will go inside those accelerated servers. But then over time, as you said, as you know, the workloads kind of proliferate out, yeah. we talked about getting access to developers who write new applications. Yeah. When that happens, we see you know, the workloads start migrating closer to the edge, and then you move away from AI servers to something like AI workstations, maybe AI PCs, you know, people have already started talking about that stuff, but waiting for the applications to emerge to really use AI workstations and, AI and even PCs. AI embedded in devices, AI and phones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's going to be everywhere. Machines and right? it's going to be everywhere. So, but, yeah. but the follow-up on that is the volume economics. I mean, yeah. volume is everything in yeah. silicon markets. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. so, how do you see that playing out? And and then, do you think that will come back in in, in a way to ripple in and disrupt maybe the enterprise economics? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that could happen, and that uh, you know, uh, and when you when you say enterprise economics, uh, you know, today most of the enterprises kind of are still holding on uh, because you know they value their data, right? And uh, will will that change? I don't see that changing. I yeah. think uh, you know that is their core IP, and I think what they're missing today is the ability to harness that data, right? Because they're sitting with, you know, many of these companies are sitting with yeah. tons of data that they haven't used for years and decades, right? I mean, there is, you know, there's, there's a statistic out there that says 90 plus yeah. percent of the data is unused and unmined, right? So the first order of business for these folks would be like, hey, can I take what's available? Can I take this AI compute infrastructure if I were to upgrade it? Can I harness my data better? Can I do more with the data that I have? Uh, can I make better decisions? Can I improve profitability? Can I do, so those will be the real metrics and I think people are waiting to see that. It's interesting that your point there, Dave, is in, in comment is that in the traditional cloud market, databases were the biggest users of EC2, which yeah. Amazon loved because yeah. they would make mm -hmm. a lot of bank on that. But now with GPUs, it's XPUs. It's a combination of things because you might have different use cases because now that data is being separated from the database yeah. and cataloging, governance becomes the new layer. Yeah. You got to manage, that's a whole nother potential diverse compute, or what do you call it if it's GPU? I guess it's still compute. It's, it's a different thing. So you have GPUs, mm -hmm. CPUs, TPUs, or XPUs, any, any, any processing device. Yeah, yeah. It's not just a processor. Yeah, There's yeah. things around it. Correct, exactly. And that's, you know, I mean, if you look at our platform, it is kind of a collection of processors as I alluded to earlier. But we are entering a world of heterogeneous computing, right? It is gone are the days when you say everything runs on a CPU. Those days are long gone now, right? So now you have CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs. Yeah. In some cases, accelerators for sure. Different kinds of accelerators, right? Uh, analytics accelerator, the AI accelerator. So I think uh, that is going to be table stakes, I think. Um, you know, and most of the big compute infrastructure companies are comfortable with that. They, they realize that that's where, that's where the world is headed. So yes. the monolithic designs yeah. are pr predominantly going to be <clears throat> for big training jobs or even big inferencing jobs. I mean, Jensen says 40% of their enterprise yeah. work, you know, workload or revenue comes from inferencing, but it's chat GPT and, yeah. and so, but not, it's not, AI inferencing at the edge, which is the, the big market that you're going after, or at least a big market, one, yeah. one of yeah. them, right? Yeah. So is that right, that, that monolithic has its place, the chiplet architectures have their place? How do you see that all you know, shaking out? What's the best strategic fit from a workload standpoint? Well, I mean, everything starts with a monolithic approach, right? I mean, that's, if you look at the evolution of any, any kind of compute, it starts with monolithic, and then you know, the monolithic serves to kind of yeah. kickstart, uh, you know, uh, adoption of many different applications, and then over time uh, it's, you know, kind of fragments out because it goes to so many different places, there's just no way that a single compute uh, form factor can serve every single application, so it kind of fragments out. That happened with mobile, that happened yeah. with, uh, you know, personal computing, 
Yeah. Uh, so this is going to be no different. Although I would consider what Apple does in, in mobile monolithic. Is that not? Is that a misunderstanding of what Apple's doing? From a stack standpoint? It's sure. It's got a big SRAM. It's shared. It's a monolithic. I think it's a monolithic. Well, design. they have moved to now. So they they have moved to chiplets now. If you look at the latest M1, M2 architecture, right? They are slowly moving to chiplets, okay, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, you know, because again, it's certainly like, Broadcom's there, and, yes. and uh, now they have an NP. I mean, you know, in the case of Apple, I believe uh, they have an NPU integrated into into their CPU. But I think if you look at other uh, phones, I mean, they actually have a separate NPU chip, uh, an AI engine, along with the CPU. So already, if you look at, you open up a phone today, there's yeah. probably going to be multiple different chips doing different functions yeah. inside that and phone. And Tesla as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's the question I want to get at. I mean, there's an analogy I've heard I love is that it's like wine pairing. You know, I yeah. get steak, I get red wine, fish, white. You pair your chips, yeah. chip pairing, and is around what you're trying to do, whether it's workload. So you have a lot of different potential combinations of this and that. And this seems to be what's going on in these clustered systems where yep. memory is more memory intensive. Yep. How, do, how do people figure out when to do the right thing? What's the right combinations? I mean, this is a system architecture problem to solve. Yep. There's no one general purpose, or there could be a general purpose monolithic thing, but as people start designing and custom silicon hits the scene very quickly, the cycles to get chips out, yep. it could be a world where every perplexities of the world and open it has their own chips or the cube has its own chip. Yeah. You know, for <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be too much fragmentation uh, yeah. because uh, you know, the, uh, you know, we went back to the volume <laughs> economics of silicon, right? I yeah. mean, uh, if, if the cube were to do your own chip, I mean, do you have the yeah. volume to support it? So I think every business at some point, there is, there is an underlying business that has to make sense. So no, I think the applications will then adjust uh, to enable volume economics of semiconductors, right? So you can't have so many fragmented applications that it, everybody needs their own chip. There's going to be some kind of consolidation. We're pretty excited about uh, what's happening with uh, transformer workloads in AI because that is one you know, unifying architecture yeah. that is allowing AI to run across different applications, multimodal, mm -hmm. right? Video, audio, speech, text, search. Yeah. Everything running on a common underlying architecture. Is there is there enough commonality in those? Let's to John's wine pairing question. I love that analogy. Yeah. Uh, is there enough commonality in those specific use cases within you know on the long tail of, yeah. of the power law, such that you can get volume economics? Where does that that come from? Or is there a bit of a challenge there? Can you help us? Well, the volume that? economics would have to come from an application, right? The unifying application architecture, right? I mean, you you cannot have so many different. Uh, application architecture that they require different types of underlying silicon. Uh, well, Risk Five gives you that. Risk Five would give you that, sure. but then it may not give you the kind of performance you need because Risk Five is a CPU. Right? That's where you guys. That's come where in. we come in, and exactly. And I think the thing that was missing in AI was uh, a unifying uh, model architecture, right? And uh, with the transformer, uh, yeah. it's now gaining in you know popularity. That is becoming the unifying model architecture. You can actually, and it is scaling very well. I mean, you look at you know OpenAI's Sora model, which is a video model, you know image generation models, speech, text, audio, search. Everything is now running on uh, a transformer-like model, right? And so you can build a piece of silicon uh, that can run across all these models and get volume economics. Yeah. And talk about the impact of high performance interconnects because yeah. in these new architectures, you're connecting GPU to GPU, other systems, and Ethernet's in there. Yeah. You got to have you got to have a backbone. Yeah. So if you have all of these systems clustered together like a motherboard on a PC or a server in a data center, the interconnect becomes a key point. So memory connects to processing. This is you, what you guys are in the middle of all this. Right. What's the What's the core problem statement that's an opportunity in interconnects and what are people working on? Yeah, so that's a great question because um, interconnects are a very, very important part of the solution here, right? Because what's happening is models are getting bigger and they don't fit on a single chip anymore, right? So you've got to scale it out, scale it up, right? And uh, when you scale up within a single node or a single system, you are using either, uh, you know, die to die interconnects or chip to chip interconnects, right, to connect multiple chips within a system to get more compute inside that system. Uh, and then you need to go outside the system. So now the workload needs to be scaled out because it's just so big that you need to connect system. So there is system interconnects, uh, right? And that's typically ethernet or infinite band or you know, what have you, right? There's multiple choices out there. So no, I think inter uh, interconnects are, are a big part of this and there is a lot of innovation, uh, yeah. you know, whether it's die to die, chip to chip, card to card, system to system, yeah. uh, plenty there's of- a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a design art to this. I mean, it's like yeah. almost like an artist. Yeah. You have to, because the laws of physics also come into play here too. Yeah. Because yeah. you got the chiplet architecture that gives you the flexibility. Mm -hmm. And of course you have to go in that direction to be able to participate in all, mm -hmm. all areas of the power law. But 
if I understand it, those connections are asynchronous, and as it gets bigger and bigger, it gets more complicated, but the monolithic architectures are too expensive, yes. and they, they, they eat up too much power. Yep. So this is you know, the real massive problem to be solved is Correct. kind of in the middle, and that's really what you're going right, after. Right, right. That's, that's a hard problem that's, to solve. That's a hard problem to solve. Uh, I think uh, we, we have uh, tried to find something that gives us enough modularity and flexibility and elasticity that allows us to scale across you know, the different uh, sections of your power law there. Yeah, right. um, but at the same time, uh, not sacrificing uh, performance. But that's why we kind of focus a lot on inference. We don't, don't try to do training, and we don't try to do HPC, and we don't try to do graphics, and we don't try to do any of those stuff right. right in our platform. It's focused on inference and inference only. And it's focused on inference for generative AI, which is now got a unifying model architecture with Transformer. So that allows us to focus our platform on something, as opposed to trying to be too generic. Right? Yeah, great. So take, take us through, um, the company, what's the status of where you guys are at, what yep. market are you targeting specifically in, in your customer base, and what use cases are you targeting that you see immediately, yep. and then kind of what's down the road, where do you see it, kind of, where's the puck going? Yeah, yeah. so uh, as I stated earlier, we started, uh, the company was started in 2019, uh, and with an emphasis on inference. Uh, we are not trying to do, you know, trying to boil the ocean here by doing a lot of different things. Focus on inference, where we got lucky, maybe some insight, some luck, was we made a bet on transformer acceleration pretty early on in the company. And that turned out to be the underlying engine of generative AI. Uh, so we built a platform from the grounds up foundationally that is now very, very well suited for generative AI acceleration for inference only, right? Uh, our focus is on uh, really uh, deploying the solution. We are going to be launching our product in the second half of this year. Uh, we are working with uh, you know, data center customers, uh, both big and small. So these are cloud scale customers and uh, smaller data center customers that want to deploy the solution. Uh, and uh, our, our feeling is the narrative, as you can already hear it in the, you know, you go out and read the newspapers or listen to, you know, uh, you know TV, and uh, people are talking about, okay, show me the money. It is yeah. time for, yeah. you know, we've trained enough. It is time to deploy the stuff, and we want to return on investment on all the CapEx that, you know, investments that we are making. So it is time for people to start getting a return on, on how AI is going to be useful. And that's where inference comes in, and that's where the yeah. puck is going, and that's where we come. That's so the November of 2022 was a was a great month for you yeah. right, when you saw that the, <laughs> the GPT here around yeah. the world. It was like uh, that, that that affirmed your bet. Yes, well, the inference yes, has yes. the apps. The inference has the application angle on it. Yeah. That's where the apps are going to play. Yeah, big time. So what's the the bet was transform acceleration got that? Yeah. Obviously, your targeting inference is awesome. Where's the next bet coming? What's your next bet as you guys go forward? Well, I think the next bet is going to be around fine tuning, right? So I think what will happen is as people start deploying AI and start doing more inference, uh, we talked about fine tuning there, you know, it's, they may not want to go back and do pre-training because that is the part, you know, you do that, you know, once and then you deploy, but you want to fine tune based on any new learnings. That is yeah. how human beings operate. You know, we talked about the human beings yeah, exactly. analogy. You're learning new stuff, you're fine tuning your knowledge and applying it again. And so we are actually now looking at building our platform to enable fine tuning. So we are, you know, we can do inference really, really well. We think we'll do it really well but we also want to give our customers the ability to find you. And who are you selling to right now? Who's your customer? That you're so our customers would be the big data centers, uh, the big cloud scale uh, data centers. There are smaller data centers. These are smaller enterprise. Uh, you know, I would, I would basically break it into three buckets, right? There is the cloud scale data centers. Uh, there are the sovereign AI data centers. And then there are the, what we call the specialized AI or the GPU clouds. They mm -hmm. call them GPU clouds, but they are also doing other types of compute, but it's like kind of more specialized data centers. And what's the pitch to them? What's the value? The pitch to them is you don't have to change anything in your data centers. Um, you know, we are not, we are not the, you know, a company that will come in and tell you, hey, look, we don't like a bunch of stuff that you have. You have to rip and replace anything. No. Keep your infrastructure, your rack infrastructure the way it is. We'll come in and help you do more stuff with it, right? So we'll come and plug into your existing infrastructure uh, and we'll be able to give you a much better return on investment on that sunk capital uh, that you're What are you with. plugging in, exactly? We are plugging in a server which has our accelerator cards in that. Awesome. Uh, in that yeah. So thanks for coming on being part of our inaugural AI Silicon Valley Leadership Series with the NYSE Wired Group. Thanks for coming in the studio. We'll see you tonight at the reception. Thank you, thank you for having All me. All right, cool. You're watching theCUBE here. We're in our Palo Alto Suits. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE with Dave Vellante. This is the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leader Series. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with another video of this short break. <laughs>